Welcome to episode five, everyone. We're so glad that you're with us. Now, you're going to love what we have coming up. We have a fascinating interview, actually, Patrick does, with Ari Bar David. Ari Bar David, I think, won the vote for the whole crew that was in uh, Israel for the most inspirational interview that we did. The man has an incredible story, fought in five wars. He's a Messianic Jew, a Jew that has accepted Christ as the Messiah that was prophesied. He did something that's kind of unusual in Israel. He created a Christian kibbutz, and uh, from that grew this amazing community. But at the center of Ari Bar David's interview is his faith, and the experience, the direct experience they had with that faith that translated to the saving of many men that he was responsible for in a war. So when he tells the story, it's gripping. And the way that he tells it brings it to life, and it's something that is transformative. So I'll, I'll never forget as we were there and, and the crew was around us and they were listening to the story, everybody was just on the edge of their seat and engrossed. So you're going to really, really enjoy Ari Bar David. Ari, we're surrounded by a, a beautiful place here, and I know that you have quite a story, so I'm looking forward to this conversation. Thank you for taking your time. Yeah, we are really in one of the most, most, not only beautiful, but meaningful place yeah. in the land of Israel. So your story goes back uh, to your father, yeah. who uh, came from Bulgaria, yeah. um, which, uh, br where she came here, brought his family. But can you tell his story about his journey from Bulgaria to here? Yeah, actually my father uh, was born to a very rich family in Bulgaria really powerful family. He, he was one of six children. Mm -hmm. He was the elder of them. And from very, very little, really childhood, he was eager to know God. Yeah. It's very interesting, but Bulgarian sh Jewish people usually, they are very secular. Yes. You know, they consider themselves good people. We don't need God, you know. But uh, in my father, it was really burning. Who is God? How to reach him? How to... And uh, he felt holiness of God. When he was in the synagogue and people were talking about money or business, he really pushed their trousers when they were like three, four years old, mm -hmm. telling them, stop, stop, holy place, stop. Yeah. Uh, so in his youth, he was reading and reading. Mm -hmm. My father could talk 11 languages wow. and he would never read a book not in the original language, never. So it was really, I mean, plowing, yeah. you know, over books and books to find God. He never found it. Mm. He was uh, studying in Switzerland, mm. in university economy, because of the business of the family, sure. but philosophy yeah. and astronomy to find God. Mm -hmm. And after he finished his tema, you know, in philosophy, Hegel, Nietzsche, and Aplaton, mm -hmm. He really, he felt that he knew a lot, but it didn't mean to him anything. Mm. And what happened when he finished his studies, he was there in the university, and one morning he was sitting in his room, doesn't have any satisfaction, mm -hmm. and he heard a band of musicians uh. walking down under a dish in Lucerne, near the lake. Uh -huh. He went down to the road, and he saw a group of fanfara players, uh -huh. you know, trombone, cornets, trumpets. He looked on them and they were walking left, right, <laughs> left. He looked something in their apparel attracted him. Uh -huh. And when they just passed by him, one of the players, as he was playing, he was took, taking a little booklet from his shirt and put it in my father's pocket uh -huh. and continued. Now, my father was very surprised. What can be inside, right? So he opened it as he went back to, the, to his room in the university. And immediately he saw sentence, written sentence that he never heard it. it. By the way, it was in English before. Verily, verily, I say unto you. Amen, amen, I say. What? What is this kind of combination of words? So it really shocked him because the Hebrew way, if it was Hebrew source, it will be rabbi yeah. 
Eliezer, in the name of Rabbi, another name, right. said. Right. But here, truly, truly, I. And this is a man that read a lot, lot, lot. He never found such combination. He decided, I want to see who is this one. Uh -huh. Who is this one that talks with such authority? Yeah. That what shocked him. And this little booklet was the Gospel of Matthew, and actually opened in the Sermon on the Mountain. Wow. And this is what saved him. He could not stop it. Yeah. He read it again and again, and he felt for the first time in his young life that this is the answer of what he was looking for. You know, it was a big story what happened there because his family, you know, for them to hear that one of their sons turned to be, to believe, to believe in Yeshua, it was something that they couldn't deal they didn't with. accept, yeah. No, it was a big story, of course. They took him out of the family. Actually, what he did, he left Switzerland straight to Israel. Wow. It was 1928. Wow. He was 23 and a half years old. And just with a little luggage, landed in Jaffa, put it in, you know, the luggage in the store, and looked around in the country, right? What he's going to do. But that's what he felt, that he has to come to the land of Israel. That this is a promised land, that God wants him here. I mean, it was very, very quick, all these decisions. And that's how he arrived here. And, and this is interesting, because he's Jewish. Yet he becomes what's uh, you know now they refer to as a messianic Jew, a Jew that accepts Jesus as the prophesied savior. Yeah, and and he comes to Israel in the 1920s. So this is before 1947, 48, when long yeah when there was a country that exactly. was actually you know formed, um, and yeah, so that was a very daring thing to do. Now, did you tell me also he was the first messianic Jew? in Israel. That started a family. That started a family right, here. in Israel. You see, because now people say Messianic Jews, everyone understand. Just to clarify something about this, a Messianic Jew does not consider themselves converted to Christianity. No, of course not. Yeah, I know, but a lot of people think that, oh, they, they converted to Christianity. They don't convert to Christianity. They they're, they're still have their Jewish Old Testament practices yeah. But they accept the Gospels and they accept Christ. You're right. I said it now in Israel, everyone knows, knows what is. Yeah, yeah. But uh, let me tell you, for my father to start so many years ago, this identity that we are Jewish people, because Yeshua was a Jewish people, yes. and the disciples were Jewish people, mm. and all the stories here in this land, is in the Sea of Galilee, yes. and they were eating the same food that we are eating and talk the same language that we are yeah. talking. Yes. Mixing with Aramaic, yeah. not Greek at all. Right. This is so Jewish, so Israeli, so connected to this land. And for him, it was really pioneering yes. to go this way. Because in those days when people have heard about him and then starting, we were a big family, seven children. Uh, uh, you know, they wrote to him all kind of letters. For instance, uh, I'm the third one and I want volunteers to be a part -tuper, you know. Yes. And you know how many letters my father got? How you let your son go to be a part -tuper? You have to be pacifist. Mm. You should not serve in the Israeli army. Right. You have to teach your children that, you know, things like this. Mm. And because we had to really pave a way that never nobody walked in this way. Yes. Because again, like you said, very right. We're not converted to, because we are Jewish people that believe in Yeshua like it was 2000 years ago. So why to be converted? A mm. uh, praise the Lord. For many years we were only 30, 20, 30 people. Many years. I remember when we were more than 100. Mm -hmm. I remember it like it happened yesterday. Actually, I remember when we were more than 50 <laughs> because it was first camp that we did. And we had a big bus and we had a little Volkswagen. This little one, how you call it, you know, bu uh, bug. bug. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that we were proud that we need a bug <laughs> because we are more than 50. Yeah. And my father always told us, 
you will see when we will be not only 100, but 300 and 700, he was not living enough to see that we are more than 10,000, more than 15,000, and maybe 20,000 now. Yes. But uh, I think now, now it is so clear, so clear that the way that really he paved is so clear in this country. I mean, when I look on the hundreds of believers that are serving in the army, yes. in every unit, from pilots in the Air, Air Force, and they are, they are Israelis, you see. Yes. What a way we had to pass. Yes. What a way. And look, it was very short after the Holocaust. Yeah. We were living in, in the middle of Jerusalem. Almost all our neighbors were Holocaust survivors. Wow. And for them, we were m worse than the Nazis because the Nazis were German Lutherans. Right. And for them, we were worse than betrayers. Wow. All my childhood, I've heard that you are worse then the Nazis, they try to kill us physically, you are killing us spiritually mm -hmm. with all your ideas and so on, you know. But uh, praise the Lord, our home was our church, if you want to call it mm -hmm. this way. And as we grew more, we were seven children, we had two adopted children. We had grandmother, grandfather, grand-grandmother, aunt of grandmother, I mean, big family, every night. Every night, sometimes we really passed pogroms. Mm. Every night, all the family, we were on the knees in Jerusalem, cold floor, cold floor, really, on the knees. And my father shared with us from the gospel, a lot from Matthew, a lot from the Sermon on the Mountain, mm. and everyone praying in his time. And this was the feeling, you see, that's what filled us to grow normal yes. and not rebel. Uh -huh. You see, we are now more than 100 in my family yes. with all the children, with grandchildren. We are more than 100. And unbelievable, but no one of the big family, no one left faith. They all stayed in the faith, Yeah, the whole family. All the family. That's it's unbelievable. Un it is unbelievable. Yeah, and but it's, again, it goes back, you know, to the daily plowing yeah. that's looking far away forward plowing and walking not about what happens yes. because it can break you yeah now because you have here now what started as the first uh you know uh, messianic kibbutz right uh, yeah. where you know you got together uh, as a commune of jews who accepted the messiah yeah and uh, and that started with just a few eight families i think how many families yeah, we actually the story started with a group of Finnish people. Finnish people, yeah. Very, very special story. You know, in Second World War, a, it happened that I don't tell you now the story. It's very well known. There were movies about it. But what happened that after Germany, 1938, they commanded to, you know, to all the Jews to leave Germany. And some of them spread to the West, Denmark, Holland, Netherlands, so some of them to Sweden, some of them to F uh, Finland. Mm -hmm. What happened first September when the Second World War started, you know that seven months later, Hitler conquered all West Europe. Yeah. And actually what happened, he conquered all those places that the Jews that were evacuated from Germany, now they are. Right. So there were Jews in Finland around 1,800, mm. and the Hitler demanded them that they will be brought back because they are German refugees. Mm -hmm. The Prime Minister of Finland, Mannerheim, said, sorry, they are not German refugees. They are now Finnish citizens. Yes. You're not going to get anyone back. Mm. This was very, very tension time because Finland was in a big war with Russia. Uh -huh. It's called the Winter War. And the foreign minister of Finland, you know, he was very afraid because German threatened Finland to start a war against her. Mm -hmm. And he, un he knew that it will not be able for Finland to... S so he decided to make a treaty, a kind of agreement with the Germans. They will send a ship. It will look like British. They will tell all the Finnish Jewish to arrive to Helsinki port and they will take them to England. 
this was the what he planned. Mm -hmm. And the ship arrived, and you know, British people in the ship. And the moment they started talking, I mean, the German accent yeah. was too strong. Mm. So there was a fight on the ship, really fight. Mm. Jewish people ran away, jumped, and so on. So, and the ship left with only eight people. Wow. These eight people, that their names are here. These are the source of the name of this village, wow. which is called the Memory of the Eight. Now, for the Finnish people, it was something they couldn't understand. How it happened that Finland lost eight Jewish people. Mm. And what happened, actually, Finnish groups started to coming and thinking and really how we can do something to memorize this eight. Mm -hmm. And it happened with a group of volunteers that came to our neighbor kibbutz, and they really thought about starting kibbutz. The story continued on and on. It arrived to Golda Mayer, our prime minister. And she, at the end, said, yes, I give you permission. So this was the only kibbutz that was done not by Israelis, by Finnish. Wow. What happened that two years after they were here, me and my two brothers arrived here. Huh. You see, we didn't know anything about them. Yeah. We didn't know about the history of what happened here. And we were running a youth camp mm -hmm. of Jewish believers, right? Youth camp. Mm -hmm. And the end of these 10 days, the Finnish people, there were also five women, one couple, and two children. They looked on us and they said, it was a dream for us to see you, young Israeli studying Bible, teaching Bible, these youth people. Please think about it. Yeah. Think and pray about coming and living here and take this place on you. Because we cannot continue. Wow. And then we found it was almost bankrupting. Mm. So look how God turned the things that uh, I was then playing in Jerusalem, symphonic orchestra, I was all kind of jobs there. And in one of the nights I really got very clear Aria, you have to leave music, you have to leave the orchestra, you have to leave all what you are doing and start building this place. It was nothing, it was a bare mountain, yes. nothing. Wow. Uh, so we came, my younger brother, and then we are two brothers married to two sisters, and then a fourth one came, and we started building this. Slowly, slowly, we decided we don't take any loans. Mm -hmm. We just, from what we have, what we earn, this is the way that we build this place. And, how, and now, these many years later, you have how many families? 56, 56. believers' families. Wow. Yeah. And now, I walk through this area you call the uh, Biblical Gardens. Yeah. What do they represent? You know, from the beginning, beginning, I speak about 40 years ago, we felt that uh, this is a place that we want to teach, to teach Bible. Also Israelis, also mm. non-Israelis, I mean Christians. Uh, and we decided to keep the most beautiful place, mm -hmm. to keep it for biblical garden. What is the meaning of biblical garden? We have here like 16 stations. Mm -hmm. Each one of these stations, we can spend one hour and two hours even, like threshing floor, mm -hmm. wine press, oil press, living stone. It's amazing how much this biblical garden helps for me, which I'm head of the teachings and guidings in this place, uh, how much, how many hundreds of hours I shared with groups to teach them about the Bible. Yeah. And uh, it is such a blessing. By the way, my younger brother, he designed all this. He designed it, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, so many experts came and they looked in the biblical garden. It was so beautiful <laughs> with the architect. And I told them, my younger brother, mm -hmm. what is his name? You know, they are ready to hear a big name. Yeah. No, he just hardly <laughs> he finished high school, so he studied something in high school. This amazing. That's what we found yeah. in our life. Yes. That when God is giving a gift. Like Betzal El, Oliav, you know this name is biblical. Yeah. He's giving it. Yes. He's giving it, and if you are faithful on what you are doing, it can use you for so beautiful thing. And it's such a blessing 
So we're sitting here right now uh, in the hills around Jerusalem. I guess Jerusalem's pretty close to here. I mean, you're almost looking across at it, I think. Oh, it's that, that direction. Right. Okay. I get turned around, you know, walking, yeah, yeah, walking yeah. around, but a lot of hillside here. So you spent most of your life in this area. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you've also seen a lot of changes because uh, you've lived your whole life here. Yeah. Uh, and you were also in the military, and, and you how many wars have you been in? In five. Of five the wars. wars. Wow. So what was that like? Um, you know, as you're, so here you are, you're the first generation in the Holy Land that your father came here. And, uh, you know, you have a small community that, you know, believe in the Messiah. And uh, then the wars come and you're fighting side by side, of course, with other Israelis. Uh, what was the experience trying to defend the Holy Land? You know, first of all, you know for what you are fighting. Yeah. This is very important, and mainly as a park trooper, you know, he, if it, the first war was 67 war. Yes. And uh, for me, the reality of Jerusalem was every day. Yeah. As, as, a, as a child, a small child, you know, the shooting, the legionnaires yes. were shooting from the walls, right? And you wake, and <laughs> everything is under you. And we were driving from Jerusalem, for instance, to Tel Aviv. Whenever we started getting down the slope, all of us, we had to bend down in the car because they were shooting from what we call today, Nebi Samuel. Uh, they had a machine gun. Yeah. I mean, the main road was just under the machine gun wow. of the legionnaires, right? And this is this is prior to 67 that, that Before happened. Before 67. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Because Jerusalem was under Arab control then. All around us, yeah. all was surrounded, yeah. all surrounded. And in those days, the reality really, really was if you grow in such a city, right? that uh, it's, it's like no air. <laughs> yes. No air. You make a little mistake, like we were, we were walking to Ramat Rachel one day, and just shooting, just shooting, shooting on us, and you start finding something to, uh, to hide. It was, but nobody saw that there is going to be any solution to this. And that's why I was born in... Uh, hospital, Hadass Hospital, mm. on Mount Olives. Mm -hmm. But it fell into the hands of the Jordanians. Mm -hmm. So Ben-Gurion decided to build another Hadassah. Uh -huh. He built another Hadassah, which is Ein Karim. And he finished it in 1966. Uh -huh. Okay, I remember this year. I remember the celebrations. Nobody knew that in one year everything is going to change. Wow. You see? Mm. I remember they celebrated that they put... The model of Jerusalem, there is a beautiful model of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Uh -huh. It was ready in 1966. Wow. And first time you stand there, I was like 19 years old, and you see the model, and you see all what happens in the Arabic area that we never saw it, right. because we were on the Jewish side. Right. A year later, 67 war started. Wow. Look, I belong to the Partupers. I was in regular, in regular army. Uh, we were fighting in Egypt, you know, others were fighting, other my brothers were fighting against Syria army. Jordan was not supposed to be at all in this story. Mm -hmm. And King Hussein made, somebody will say mistake, but I think it was God <laughs> pushed him to enter to the war on Monday. Yeah. He entered 12 o'clock at noon, and that's what brought Israel to conquer the West Bank. Wow. and to release Jerusalem, and suddenly to be back, you see, the road to Jericho. Look, this was prophetical days, I have to say. Well, this, and this is my question, so with your faith, and then also being in the military, uh, do, you, do you feel or did you experience, uh, or you know, do you see God's intervention into all this? Uh, because do you see what you were able to do in the Six Day War, for example, as miraculous? Very, very, exactly. Like it defies logic. Uh, definitely. I want, I, I want to tell you, I, ne I was open believer, mm. totally open. Because for me, the Lord is number one in everything. Yes. So it's not that I try to do... Ma, 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 da, da, da. No, this is very, very strong. Yes. So as, as a even young commander, right? And then officer, you know, my faith is part of me. Yes. So in 67 war, I have to say that actually what happened to the soldiers themselves, I could almost catch them, gluing them. Yeah. They wanted me to teach them Bible. Later on in, in Yom Kippur War, six years later, 73, 
I was really giving Bible studies deep, deep in, you know, where we have been in Africa. Uh -huh. Because suddenly people, and even regular people, they felt that what we pass is something prophetical. Yes. You see, I don't speak about the religious people. Uh, and again, to be part of all this, to teach them Ezekiel 38, 39. I can tell you things you can believe that I'm st what I passed. I if you put my name in, in Google, you will find a lot of sharing about the war, what I passed in the wars. Um, no doubt, I, I, I feel, I feel myself, now I'm, I passed 70, right? Yeah, yeah. I feel 50, 40, <laughs> I don't know. But I passed 70, yeah. that uh, the way that God led me in this country, all my life. This is something that I have a lot of responsibility mm -hmm. with this past. You understand? Yes. Lot of responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, when people talk about biblical miracles and so on, I was witnessing again and again and again Can to you the give, most, give now me, the modern. Give me some example of, of, of uh, maybe one example that, of a miracle that you feel like you witnessed. Again, <laughs> There are military, of course, yes. things, and there are dozens, you yeah. know. And uh, I don't want to talk about myself because it's him, right? It's really him. But um, let me, let me, okay, give you one, one little, little thing, not, not a big, the big things there are in books and so on. Uh, Yom Kippur War, you know, it was 1973. This was the hardest. Yes, we were fighting. Actually, a lisrod it is to survive. Yeah. There was no one over you. No one. You, you, we didn't have. We went to all kind of missions. No maps. No <laughs> ammunition. Even nothing. It was just as a commander. I had my twenty-four soldiers. I wanted them to get alive. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. And uh, during. You know, the war started two o'clock on Yom Kippur War. And from the beginning, the moment we have heard that something happens, because too many ministers were driving, you know, with their uh, private cars right. to meet in Tel Aviv, people felt something happens. So just beginning, I told my wife the code of my unit. I told her, write down the code. If you hear it, write what you hear and tell me, I will know what to do with this. I had 10 minutes to decide what I take to the war. Wow. You know, I remember 56 war was only one week. 67 war was one week. Yeah. I told to myself, ah, it will be maybe two weeks. Uh -huh. For two weeks, you take one at the ground, two others, yeah. this one, one this. Which Bible to take, the small one or the <laughs> war Bible, I called it, right? <laughs> I took the war Bible. <laughs> and all together, I was more than five and a half months away of home. You see, wow. from beginning, it, is, it was far away harder than everything that we passed before. And when we came to the place where we got everything ready to enter inside, there was a terrible, terrible feeling around the soldiers. Terrible. Mm. And somebody comes to me and says, Arie, you, you don't feel what happens here? I said, what happens here? I don't know. I'm ready. I'm preparing myself, you know. You don't understand what happens here looking around you. <laughs> I'm looking around you, all, you know, the unit, everyone is. You're the only one that is laughing here, don't you see it? Mm -hmm. And then I, get, I caught myself. I looked, all faces, hundreds of people, you know, faces like going to, sorry, to cemetery. Mm -hmm. And I was the only one which I'm, so I, I, can't, I caught myself. To be like them, you know, I cannot. Yeah. I cannot, really, I cannot. You know, there is a joy in you that is going out, whatever, whatever passed. And I understood just from this moment that I have to be on the side of people. I have to really encourage people. And I can tell you, I can tell you, some of them it's already more than 40 years. So many of them fell into post-traumatic things because of what we passed. Yes. That it's, 
it's hard to believe. And if you ask me, look, I was in situation, very hard battle, very, very hard battle. I, I don't want now because it's at least half an hour mm -hmm. to tell really, really, really in details what happened there. But the greatest, I tell you, the greatest miracle for me that me and all my brothers, we are three paratroopers mm -hmm. that were one in the Chinese farm, another was fighting on sewage, I was with Ariel Sharon to Ismaili, really the hardest battles. Uh, one tank commander that had to change three times tank, because all the time he got a shell, one killed, two killed, you know. Mm -hmm. After one shell in a tank, most of the people cannot go back to a tank. Right. You can ask them, they... And after all what we passed, you know, no post-traumatic in my family, among my brothers, no any, any scratches. And I don't speak about the physical, I got a bullet here, okay, operation, they take the bullet, mm -hmm. who, f who knows about it, you understand? But the spiritual things, mm. it didn't enter to any one of our, my brothers. And I know, I know very well, some of them what they passed. You know, for me, it is the greatest, mm. greatest miracle. And in one of these situations was that we entered into Egyptian area. We were the, you know, you have Arrowhead, yeah. and we, the unit of the paratroopers, we were really the You're the tip, tip of, of the spear, yeah, yeah. And our commander, Ariel Sharon, and he was pushing, pushing to conquer a Nufasia Junction, to conquer a certain place that is, if we conquer this, this is the main road from Ismailia to Cairo. Mm -hmm. And we were already a two, three hours after the American and the Russians were, were posting on us a ceasefire. Mm -hmm. And we're continuing fighting. And another one is killed. And the third one. And the fourth one. And we know, we know, and we enter into very hard darkness. And we were so inside the Egyptian area a, that suddenly, you know, we have heard, stop, stop, don't, you know, continue forward. A, just minutes before this, three of the tanks that were not far from us, every one of them got like nine RPG shells mm. and the burning with the people inside. Mm. And now how to go back? I mean, we were commanded to go back to where our forces were at six o'clock. We had no maps. The, the sky was so red of the smoke of the burning. You know, vehicles are yeah. burning. You don't see sky, you don't see any star. My, one of my professions was navigating, mm -hmm. right? Jumping and navigating in desert, wherever you want. I couldn't see one star, I couldn't see. And you know, the high, high commander there came to me, he put on me, you have to bring us back. Hmm. And I remember I looked on him, I told him, look, I have no idea where I am. Because, you know, we were, we're continuing north, that's what I knew. Mm -hmm. but, but God will bring us back. Now, if you say something like this in the army, come on, <laughs> let us have another one. Yeah. And whatever I tell you, you do. Right. It's clear. He said, whatever you'll say, we will do. I tell you to run, we run. I tell you to jump to the right, to the jump to the side, whatever I say. I don't know what I'm going to tell you. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we arranged all the group. We were more than 30. Most of them were wounded. Everyone that was wounded in this part could walk. Mm -hmm. But those, like, one was, uh, his leg was cut, another one his hand. Mm -hmm. We had to carry them because they lost so much blood. Mm -hmm. And imagine now a group of 30 people <laughs> like this, and I'm in front of them, all around Egyptians, oh. Egyptian and Israeli. You know, because nobody knew where he is. Uh, shooting all around, sudden shootings. And as we started, I saw a light. This is maybe the greatest thing that ha happened. I saw a light. Mm -hmm. Uh, later on, you know, rabbis asked me, what was this light? Describe it. And I say, I cannot describe it. It was more strong than any light that I experienced. Like, you know, when you take a tank projector yeah. and you open the projector, it can bring light to two, three kilometers. Right. They were much stronger. I remember the angle, like 15 degrees angle. Mm -hmm. And what I felt that I don't control myself anymore. 
that the light is controlling me. Later on, they interview journalists, rabbis, the soldiers, and they just repeated what I tell you. And as we continued, as we start moving, I hearing myself crying, shouting, run, run, run. And we, with all the wounded, with all this, we run like half a minute. And just behind us, where we have been, they start, fell, fell 80 millimeters, 120 wow. millimeters, 160 millimeter artillery. You know, it's earthquake. Yeah. And we are falling down. The last bomb, you know, boom, we raise up and I saw soldiers. It was very dark, but you can see in the eyes, you know, that like the nerves are broken, right? And how you know, how you know, how you knew. And I, what they said that I said, the light, the light. We continued, jump to the right. Now there were holes because it was not far from Ismailia mm -hmm. and they prepared a sewage system. Mm -hmm. New sewage system. So they dug holes of like 10 feet on 10 feet on 10 feet. Mm -hmm. All, all, all the area. I didn't know, but we entered to this area. And I, I noticed that there is one of these holes and I'm crying, jump inside. <laughs> we <laughs> fall with all the wounded people just inside. And we got again 160 millimeter to the hole next to us. Oh. And I'm talking about 10 feet. Oh. Myself, I was thrown in the air, in the air. M really, my body, right from the explosion and all the dunes, right? And falling down <laughs> on one of the soldiers, right? It was, I was sure, sure that half of the group now are killed. And iron numbers, we are nobody was scratched from this. So slowly, slowly we started getting out and people were crying. Nerves of people were broken. And again, how you knew it? Because you know, it was seconds yes. from the shouting to jump when it fell. Wow. And they said the only thing that I said is the light is the light and this is the truth. Mm. It was like I felt, later I tried to explain to a rabbi, right, that I felt like a little, little, little piece of sewing, you know. And this was like a huge magnet. Mm. And you know, it catch you and what this little metal sewing can do. I didn't control myself at all. Just, just the light. It continued. I, I, later on, we were sitting together trying like 45 to one hour. It continued this and again and again and again. And suddenly, I almost felt we are very close to our people. And in this situation, you know, friendly fire usually is the reason why, you know, so yeah. many. And God gave me wisdom. The, I didn't see any more light. It vanished. And the Lord really gave me wisdom how to make, you know, how to make the friendly, not to get shot. When our group, right, some very famous names there, I don't want to say name in this kind of thing, eh, they looked on us when they saw us, they didn't believe that we would be able to do it. They didn't believe. I mean, all the artillery that was following us, all this, and we are there. Yeah. Look, a, this appearance of this light, definitely, this was the strongest thing that happened in my life. And at the beginning, you don't understand why it is. I mean, you, you, you just know one thing. You know that the moment this high officer asked me to be in charge of bringing the people back, it's not me at all. I talk to him like as if I am, I don't know, general. Mm -hmm. Whatever I tell you, you do. I mean, I know it came from Gideon, from reading Bible mm -hmm. so much all my life. Yes. You understand? It's, it's something that what Gideon knew. He was not general. He was a simple man. Mm -hmm. But this is what I felt. Very, very strong. And of course, all the glory only to God. Whoever wanted to interview me and a lot of interview, I started all always, I'm a Jewish messianic. <laughs> and you have to know, if you interview me, I'm going to talk about the Lord Yeshua. 
Rachel. You see, I'm not going to hide it. Okay, thank you. Maybe we'll be <laughs> we'll meet you another time and so on, so on. But of course, it affected uh, some very, very influ in influential rabbis. Mm -hmm. Came to our unit. We were deep in Egypt, right? Came to our unit to speak with me. Some of them all night long. Wow! Because they've heard it. They've heard from other soldiers. They've from. I mean, they have heard what happened, and they wanted to know what is this light. Did anybody else see the light, or just you? Only me saw the light. <laughs> Only me saw the light. Uh, but all of them, uh, just that's what they said. Because when they interviewed them, they said that our commander, he just talked about the light, the light, the light. <laughs> Only me saw it. Wow. No one else. So this, I can say... I, I put so many things, but this was not so much for me because really I had, I, I was ready to everything, even to be killed, not to be, it was not for me. You know, as a tour guide now and Bible teacher, I'm, I'm guiding nonstop in Israel. When I am in Caesarea Maritima and I'm there on the stage where Paul was standing, Acts chapter 25, 26, and giving his speech to Agrippa, to Bernice, you see, to the, pro, to the Romans procurators, <laughs> and telling them, I was on the road to Damascus, <laughs> and suddenly, <laughs> and he described it, right? Yes, yes. A light came down. I understand what he's talking. You, you see, yeah. I understand, and I will understand it till the rest of my life, what he was talking. It's something that you are not the same man anymore. Mm. You saw the light. You see? So I had privilege to pass it. I know that there are thousands of others that maybe will never have this privilege. And that's why, my, again, responsibility is very strong. Yeah. And that's why one of the reasons that I felt I'm finishing with music, mm -hmm. And I was very deep in classical music, you know, in all what I passed. This is my music now, yeah. right? The Lord and to point on him. Uh, this is the only anchor that we can trust. And uh, this is why I'm living here. And this is why we are raising family here and so many more families. Because it uh, is the only reason, yeah. right, for everything. So yeah. now that uh, you're the, the son of the first Messianic Jew in Israel <laughs> and fought in five wars, all the experiences that you've had, um, with all the years and all the experience and wisdom gained, what does your faith mean to you now? Hey, okay, you know, we have six, how do you call them, senses, right? Yes. Uh, people call faith like sense number seven. For me, it's the strongest sense. You understand? Yes. You can smell, you can touch, you can this. Faith, I will say, I feel it in my life, this is the strongest sense that I every day I feel it. Every day. For me, eh, I love teach Bible. I love guide people in the desert, in Sinai. I, I really love to do it. But eh, the main thing, the main thing is really I want to see people change. I really want to see people getting ability to smile. You yeah, understand? Yeah. Going to hell sometimes, but still. Because what Jesus shared is so simple. You know, I, I matter why people don't try to taste it, <laughs> to taste it and see that it's good. Yeah. Why they are rebelling, why they are fighting, why they are, you know, trying to get and everything. So for me, I, I would say whatever I do, and I believe whatever I will do in the future, is just for this purpose. You see, to glorify God, to glorify Jesus. And mainly after the childhood that I passed, yeah. when I've heard such cursing against these two. Yes. And I remember even a child, I said, it, if God will give me life, the most important thing that I will do, to give them glory. Because they deserve it. You understand? Yes. And mainly for our nation, from our nation. So, faith means everything, really everything. 
and I'm so glad now I passed 70 years old and I see all the big family, all my grandchildren and some of them finished army, you know, some of them, you know, in the army now. And to see how they are standing is witnessing every place that they are. Really witnessing, living witnessing to who is the Lord. Well, I'm, I'm uh, almost uh, speechless because as you're describing what your faith means to you, the light just came out behind you. <laughs> it's, uh, it's an amazing thing to behold. And I think the light is also in your eyes. It shines. So, uh, you know, but it needs, it needs, you know, when I used to be a musician, you know, every day you have to practice for hours. Yes. You know, conducting, you have every, every, you know, it's a lot of work, you know, till you are 100%, right? It's practicing. Yes. The same is in our faith. Yes. If I'm not feeling myself every day, today I was like two hours reading the word in my way and signing i like to put colors yeah. in my bible yeah right in my way it's a system that i built to myself but if i'm not giving this time every day don't expect from me anything <laughs> you see yes. don't expect it's something that you have exactly like in sport right i used to do a lot of sports when i was 55 years ago right a yeah. lot of sport and again, hours and hours of training. Yeah. So faith is not coming just, you know, like drops of water. You have to take time to dedicate. One of the things that I'm one of the elders of this assembly is about the Shabbat. Yeah. God commanded a day, rest, yes. rest from the world. Yes. Very hard work here, you see, but to nourish, how do you say, to nourish yes. your face, y you see? Yeah. And of course, he, he, he's studying the word, and studying it in Hebrew, it's so rich. There is a verse, im lotta aminu, lotte amenu. You cannot translate it. It's from Chronicles, uh -huh. Second Chron chapter 20. Something like, if you don't trust, you will not be trusted. Yes. Something like this. And this is what I think about faith also. You see, it is something that you have to walk in it. You have to live in it. You have to practice it all the time. Not just when, you know, it's very hard. God help me. No, no. This is it. It, it is something that you have to live in it. Mm -hmm. Your daily life. I love very much your autonomy. Mm -hmm. Very much. I love the speech of Moses so rich after they finished 40 years in, in, the, in desert. the desert. Yeah. So rich about how to walk in faith. Mm. You see, not just theoretically to study others, but walk, walk. And you will fall, you will fall seven, you will fall 70 times. Mm. But you're always there to lift you and to continue. Uh, for me, faith is like running a race. Mm. You know, Paul, I like it, he's talking eight different places about running the race. Yeah. And you ask yourself, why? From where Paul, which is kind of orthodox, you know, yeah. what he knows about sport. Right. But he was two years in Caesarea Maritima, mm -hmm. in prison, so-called, you know, six-star prison. And what, that's what he saw. You, I don't know if you have been in Caesarea Maritima or the sea. Herod built there a huge hippodrome and invited Olympic Games there to take part. And Paul, when he was there in his so-called prison, he saw people training and training and training. And Paul is talking about running a race. Yeah. Our face is running. You see? We're not outside the stadium. Mm -hmm. We're not sitting and watching others running. We are in the stadium running. Th this is for me face. Yeah. You see the difference? Yes. Always there will be people that will point on you. But the moment you are inside, and like Paul says, with all the cloud above us that finished the race, it's so beautiful. Mm. For me, this life as a race is, is one of the most great things that I could wish, right? Yes. Running the race and never said I finished it. Like Paul, 
said all in Timothy, right? Chapter 4, I finished the race now. The cup is ready. I, the death is coming. Yes. And now he talks in past tense. I finished. I did. But when you're in the race, when you're in the face, never, never, you see, never said, I finished. And this is one of the things that I feel on myself and giving to my children, my grandchildren. I'm, I love to be with them. Yes. Take them all around the country. Yes. Teach them all the time new things. And make them better uh, racers, you can, you can call it. So there are a lot, lot, lot of things yeah. that I find in my, of the faith that I was walking, a lot of things. And I thank God for them. And always, always don't forget to encourage people around you. Mm. Never forget to do it. You know, many times we are like bugabants. That's what I feel. Yeah. We're like people that walking with, you know, in the desert. Yeah. And you see another one, you see another one. And all what you can do is to stop him. Do you know where you are? Uh, and you look on his map and... Because for me, the Word of God is a map. Mm -hmm. Topographical map, but the best map. So it shows me where I am. Do you know where you are? Mm -hmm. If he's humble enough, he will say, I think I lost my way. So what I can do... Come on, brother. Let me show you where I think. I am and you are. And if it's true, you see, two miles away, the direction there is a spring. Let us go together. <laughs> you, you understand this, the sensitivity that I felt among my people, Israelis. It's never that I know you don't know. And this one of the mistakes that I saw when so many times missionaries came to these people, mm -hmm. to our country, and they tried all the time to force you that we don't know we don't know they know you understand yeah. and it was very hard for me because god calls our nation blind people mm. and the worst thing that you can do to a blind is to show him a map and ask him don't you understand don't you see where don't you see where if you have senses you don't te tell a blind man don't you see <laughs> you understand the point yes so this is one of the things that it's a rule I think in all people that knows me and around me, never go this way. Mm. Always come, give a hand, let us go together. I think my, my map is, it, it is the way that I look on the Bible, on the Word of God, on faith, on walking in faith. Well, it's a beautiful message. I very much appreciate you sharing it with us. And I know that you've inspired a great many people today, so thank you for that. Amen. Amen. Amen.